CD Projekt Red's Cyberpunk 2077 may have been the most anticipated release of our time. Yet, in what can only be described as a disastrous launch, the game's been pulled from the PS4's digital store, players are reporting myriad bugs and glitches within the game, and its devs have become the personas non grata of the gaming world. There's just so much, potentially, to talk about when it comes to this game, and while I could spend entire videos just focusing on, say, how the game was marketed, how trying to use and even exploit social media completely blew up in its face, or how much this fiasco bizarrely echoes other recent dog piles atop actually otherwise decent games like Death Stranding and The Last of Us 2. Most of my viewers probably won't watch a video I make if it isn't about Metal Gear Solid. So for now, a shorter, more general, provisional review will have to suffice for this game. If you all want more, show me by getting this video to, say, above 15,000 views in the first two weeks. Then I'll consider making more content about Cyberpunk 2077. But for now, broadly, what did I make of CD Projekt Red's long-awaited game? Is it the train wreck it's been made out to be? And if it is, are there any redeeming features to Cyberpunk 2077? Find out my thoughts now. Cyberpunk 2077 may be based on a tabletop game from 1988 I've never played, but anyone even vaguely familiar with this genre of science fiction will recognize how exactly, even devoutly, this game has brought cyberpunk as a concept to life. At least on paper, Night City is every sprawling cyberpunk metropolis from Akira to Blade Runner to Robocop all rolled into one. And that is something that deserves praise. You could argue no prior iteration of the genre has been this total. Unlike in, say, Hideo Kojima's Snatcher or other cyberpunk games from the genre's heyday in the 90s. And even unlike more recent examples like the reboot of Deus Ex, Night City's dystopian megacity is of an unbelievably lifelike scale. There's no sprawling alley, street corner, or storefront that we can't at least pass by. And while the game's huge, the surprising number of flaws and limitations can often make Night City feel empty and barren. Once you start taking on side quests and missions, things, for the duration of those missions, with varying success, can start to feel more lifelike, or at least more lively, as a cityscape. Keep in mind for this entire review, I played the game on PC, so obviously if you're playing on console, results may hugely vary. Now immediately though, we're confronted with the biggest problem with this game. This very desire to fully realize the cyberpunk ethos as a massive open world sandbox. Technically, CD Projekt Red, if I'm not mistaken, still count as an indie studio. The idea that they could ever create a game on par with, say, Grand Theft Auto V is clearly insane. And yet, that's exactly how the game was marketed, exactly what it tried to be. The one word, I think, to sum up everything about this game's almost tragic release is hubris. The hubris of these developers, or at the very least their shareholders, and higher management is painfully clear from every meme and online clip of things like AI not working well, of bugs, of jank, and so on. There are two such random clips that I myself recorded. Arasaka. Unfortunately, I have no further details to report at this time. We are still awaiting an official statement from the Arasaka Corporation regarding these events. As
So clearly, this game needed more time. But even aside from bugs and what appear to be mere placeholders, like the missing mysterious sixth attribute, the current pointlessness of including genitalia, or the surprising lack at launch of haircuts, I think even now it's clear some of how this game was designed will never be up to snuff compared to the just insane level of hype and high expectations that people have, or rather had, for it. And no amount of patching, I don't think, will fix this. Not only is this game buggy, certain features just don't work. Driving in first person is pretty much impossible, while NPC AI, especially for drivers and police, is unbelievably limited. Combat can often feel like playing a game about 10 to 15 years old, though this gets saved somewhat by the sheer variety of weapons at your disposal. I did appreciate how completing missions non-lethally can often result in slightly different resolutions or even higher payouts, Though it has to be said, there is very little real gameplay difference apart from increased challenge between, say, knocking enemies out versus taking them out altogether. They'd never wake up, and they can be disposed of or discovered as bodies no differently than corpses. Basically, any gun can be modified to become non-lethal, without any real change, though, in how it operates beyond lower damage. I played on hard, so firefights and boss battles for me were nice and tense most of the time. I appreciated how, despite being kind of bullet spongy, enemies usually die after a handful of direct headshots. Plus, the different enemy classes, from melee to sniper, can keep things interesting and feeling less like taking on the same bad enemy AI over and over. Though maybe not as much as people wanted, Cyberpunk 2077 does have lots of RPG elements, and personally I thought this was an area where the game really worked most of the time. Both in dialogue and in gameplay, I frequently found decisions that I had made while creating and leveling my V coming into play. This is where the game comes the closest for me to something as great as Fallout New Vegas. Like New Vegas, there are skill checks that will alter what I can say and how I can play. New Vegas may have been more sophisticated in this regard, but Cyberpunk still gets closer to it than, say, Fallout 4. One thing Cyberpunk does much worse than Fallout 4 is its perks. Some of them just don't work, while most of them, like abilities in The Witcher 3, just aren't that exciting on their own. And if you want the really good ones, just putting points in your base attributes won't cut it. You'll have a completely separate progress bar, which measures how much you actually are using an attribute. And only by combining these two will really higher tier perks unlock. It isn't the worst system, marketing as it does back to say the Elder Scrolls 4, but I don't think it should take quite so long to unlock the really worthwhile perks. Along the way, you'll have to dump points into minor boosts, the kinds of weapon damage or other small stat changes, none of which are particularly too exciting. What I found much more exciting though are the weapon, clothing, and cyberware mods the game has to offer. Though mods and crafting are relatively standard today, they have special relevance for the cyberpunk genre, and this we see on full display in the game's cyberware or body enhancements. If you know where to look, these can provide almost Breath of the Wild-like game-changing new abilities like Super Jump or Berserk Mode. Though extremely expensive, it felt like a step up over even, say, GTA V to have things to really want and to use that cost serious money. This made doing side jobs more rewarding and cohesive to my overall experience. Speaking of, I love how rooted side quests are here to the 1940s era detective pulps that the genre is so indebted to. And even when I had to get more violent than investigatory, there's decent variety. Even the smallest stakes side ops keep things interesting, from thievery jobs to sabotage, SOS missions, and mini bosses. Cyberpunk 2077 opens itself up for derision and mocking vitriol because, well, most people playing it were sold the idea for years and years that this would be a game about tomorrow, a realization of tomorrow, the ultimate next-gen game. In reality, it is absolutely more about yesterday. Both conceptually and mechanically, Cyberpunk 2077 is in love with the past. 
And that right there, despite its many, many nods to punk songs, albums, and bands, despite its many references to cyberpunk movies, anime, manga, and so on, is the ultimate non-punk move. When asked in 1977 to define punk rock, godfather of the movement Iggy Pop famously said the following, Punk rock is a word used by dilettantes and heartless manipulators about music that takes up the energies, the bodies, and the hearts, and the souls, and the time, and the minds of young men who give what they have to it and give everything they have to it. And it's a term that's based on contempt, a term that's based in fashion, style, and everything that's rotten about rock and roll. The problem with punk, or post-punk, both of which were founded as a radical reinvention of the status quo, is that over time both have invariably become the status quo, no less so than the pop music and culture that they began in turn to challenge, which began back in the 1960s. Groups such as the Beatles, a group that completely unironically this game references on multiple occasions. Cyberpunk wants to include everything, even contradictory references, in its constellation of punk and proto-punk influences without stopping to realize the tensions that are created therein. Putting references to the Beatles next to say to the Vandals as the green V that represents V on the map is, or to lyrics from a band like the Dead Kennedys, to not realize the tension there is to really miss the point. To make a game so seemingly invested in the punk rock ethos that treats its by now ancient trappings and figures as icons, threatens to miss the point of punk as an ethos entirely. It may look like it, but it's missing the soul, the substance. And the same, coincidentally, applies also to how this game treats the genre of cyberpunk. More often than not, it is cyberpunk in appearance only. Cyberpunk is no longer some bold, exciting new idea. It's been done. It's died, resurrected, and died again. Cyberpunk has become just another fad or cyclical fashion, perhaps, which will inevitably return anew after long enough, no less surely than, say, aviators or vinyl records. These things have become empty products, commercialized, ironically, even as they declare outright a punk rock disdain for commercialization. The question then is how does Cyberpunk 2077 differ from those punk rock shirts and belts and bracelets that you can proudly buy from your local Hot Topic? My question going into this game, in other words, was not why Cyberpunk, but why Cyberpunk now? What new things does CD Projekt Red with Cyberpunk 2077 have to contribute to this genre? Well, I've realized that despite its original characters and scenarios, the game is not so much a new take or revolution of cyberpunk as it is an adaptation of it. No differently than how The Witcher was adapted from its pulp novel source material. The objective for CD Projekt Red, in other words, seemed not to be how can we, in rebellious, true punk-like fashion, reinvent or even question and subvert cyberpunk, but rather, how faithfully, lovingly, and exactingly can we reproduce its power, its essence, or at the very least, its appearance. This for me explains not only the somewhat generic, if, if not well-realized, cityscapes in the game, but also the equally retro-futuristic approach to base mechanics, to world building, and so on. This is not a vision of the future, but rather a vision of a fictional future as fictionalized by a bygotten past. And this applies not only, again, to the story and setting, but down into the mechanics. This game plays like a remake or revision of game design tropes from not the future, but 20, even 30 years ago. The comparison for me repeatedly was not to something like GTA 5 as much as GTA 3. Wait here. here, keep the engine running. This ain't a social call. This is the place. Wait for me here and keep the engine running. I came all this way to get the takeout. You could say that. Ain't a good time to take a rap,
to the original Deus Ex or System Shock 2 and that entire era of cyberpunk CRPGs. Trying to blend all this nostalgic, even old school design with a cutting edge, super glossy, high resolution visual style is the car, even train wreck that we are dealing with as a result. There are some things that Cyberpunk 2077 does that do feel new, or at the very least vital, worth doing differently than its ancestors. One example is street cred. In prior GTA games, your character achieved some notoriety statistically as well, but I'm not sure that this criminal score system, which would go up with every minor infraction, really ever mattered. What dictated your rank in the local crime world, more often than not, was merely your overall progress through missions. You'd unlock in games like, say, GTA 3 or Vice City, or even San Andreas, bigger clients by clearing bigger main missions. In Cyberpunk, it seems you can start attracting bigger bosses just by increasing your street rep, which can happen both by doing main quests, but also by doing side diversions. The only thing that really matters is getting that number higher. This will attract not only new missions, but new and more expensive cars for sale. Another thing the game gets completely right, for me anyway, is the writing, or at least the writing when it comes to scenarios and characterization. Personally, I loathed Keanu Reeves' character, but you can't argue that he's ever written inconsistently. He's very well defined. All the characters are well defined, and many of the quests, even the side quests, just as The Witcher 3 gained many accolades for doing, offer compelling situations and engaging sudden plot twists. If we were to compare this game to, say, Fallout 4, or even The Outer Worlds, I'd have to admit that I like Cyberpunk's take on sci-fi storytelling and game design the most. There's a brutality that permeates this game, from combat to the music and even the dialogue that brings everything together in ways that Fallout 4 never did. Cyberpunk 2077 is janky and incredibly flawed, but at least it's coherent. It does manage, in other words, to feel like a complete experience, even if it's a bug-riddled one, like more than the sum of its parts. And for all the brutality, the game has a soft, even humanistic heart, on this, I was frequently and pleasantly surprised. I'll end with this. Some reviews have said that what makes Cyberpunk 2077 special is how it makes Night City the real protagonist. I disagree. Night City, for me, is the real antagonist. Just as, ironically, CD Projekt Red have wound up as their own worst enemies. How fitting for a game that pits you in a struggle against another version of yourself, using the conceit of Johnny Silverhand to explore the paradox inherent to all games between player and player character. We've seen something like this before in, say, Deadly Premonition, or even Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain, but Cyberpunk 2077 wisely realizes that this mind versus body paradox or tension is very important to the genre that it so devoutly worships. My only major regret is that even once it's been patched to high hell, there will still be this much adoration and uncomplicated orthodoxy surrounding how the devs chose to approach this game's ancestors. They've tried even on the opening screen to hand wave away any criticism or critical thinking when it comes to interpreting video games as somehow beneath true art. This old-fashioned take where sacred cows of the canon must never be criticized or questioned, and where things like politics or critical theory must be gatekept away, must have no place amid the rarefied air of Mount Olympus, it's all unbelievably non-punk. Given how ironically CD Projekt Red's upper management seemingly became the very kind of evil corporation that this genre was supposed to fight, it makes sense that punk was never something again, for all their posturing and, dare I say, virtue signaling, that they could ever understand. What we're left with is merely a power fantasy of fighting corporations, one that we have to get in bed with corporations to fantasize. One of my favorite punk bands growing up, Sonic Youth, once implored the listener to kill your idols, if only CD Projekt Red had truly listened. Until next time, boss.